him, did it change your opinion on whom the Republicans ought to nominate? Now, this is a question I'm not interested in what lefties think about the former president. I'm interested in what you think. I've got a lot of guests I'll ask the same thing. Former Governor New Jersey, uh, Chris Christie is joining me. Dr. Michael Lauren, House Whip Tom Emmer. Uh, the most important thing substantively that came out of the debate is the president laying down a marker uh, on the debt limit urging Republicans not to bend or break. They've got to get massive spending cuts. I don't think they're going to get $5 trillion in cuts, but that's basically the Trumpian position. Default if you don't get what you need. And we'll talk with uh, Representative Patrick McH McHenry, Chair of the Financial Services Committee. We'll talk with Tom Emmer. We'll talk with Tom Cotton, Senator from Arkansas, and House Republican whip in reverse order there. And Brett Baer will be along as well to talk about um, how one does a, an interview with Donald Trump. But my number is 1-800-520-1234. Uh, and there's some other news, though. Uh, one more. Lane um, in the 916 at Sacramento. I did change my mind. I don't want him to run. I want Trump to be the lightning rod for the MSM and distract from DeSantis or whoever is the nominee. DeSantis is younger, more normal Republican fighter who doesn't create unintentional errors for MSM to beat over his messaging. Well, okay, so that doesn't sound like it changed much. I don't think many people's opinions changed or much new information last night. The new information came on the position that Donald Trump took on the debt limit, which is default, die on that hill. Die on that hill, Republicans. Die on that hill. That was the new information. As we speak, Israel is involved in a fight. Rockets going back and forth, more bombs. Prime Minister Netanyahu said that the IDF is, quote, at the height of battle as it resumed fighting uh, and ceasefire bids have sunk. A uh, nationally televised address, 400 rockets and mortars were fired from the Gaza Strip into central and southern Israel on Wednesday as the Islamic Jihad attempted to avenge the killing of three of its leaders. The IDF is responding. That could go much bigger. Um, the corrupt Romanian paid the Biden family $1 million, the Chuck Ross piece in the Free Beacon, as Joe Biden pushed anti-corruption measures in Romania. The James Comer House Oversight Committee um, hearing yesterday was remarkable and explosive. Not much coverage in the uh, legacy media. The Wall Street Journal editorial board writes an editorial this morning, the Biden family business. House Republicans on Wednesday released their latest report on the Biden family business ties, and one conclusion is that it's good to be related to Joseph Robinette Biden. Hunter Biden and his relatives traded profitably off the Biden name with transactions that suggest the main family business is influence peddling. House Oversight Chair Jim Comer's staff report shows in detail that Hunter Biden had extensive dealings with unsavory foreign actors. This yielded millions of dollars for the Biden family members via a web of shell companies that would be hard to untangle without subpoena power. Why so much complexity? The 36-page report shows Biden family members and business associates created nearly 20 separate entities shortly before and during the Joe Biden vice presidency. The, the entities with obscure names, Hudson West 3, Hudson West 5, Awasku, JBBSR Inc., transferred cash from foreign entities. Bank records show that more than $10 million was delivered to Biden family members, associates, and companies from those foreign entities in curious ways. And, I, I mean, it is just an eye-opening report. Let's go to the phones. Uh, Florida, Eddie, did uh, your opinion change of former President Trump last night? Good morning, you And no, it did not. I wasn't going to vote for him before the debate, and I will not vote for him in a Republican primary after this, excuse me, town hall. So did you watch it? Yes, I did. Um, he, he still is suing over 2020, and we as a party and we as a country need to get past that. And the press and the Democrats will use that against him 100% in the general election, and he will lose again against Biden. Thank you, Eddie. Jeff in Sunbury, Pennsylvania. Did you watch last night, Jeff? Yes, I did, Hugh. What did you think? The uh, entire town hall. Didn't change my opinion on Trump. The thing, I just wish he would move past the 2020 election. Tell us what he's going to do to fix this country, because we've got to get it back. 
So you're still going to vote for him in the Pennsylvania primary if he's on the ballot? Absolutely. All right, thank you, friend. Amy in Johnson City, Tennessee, 1-800-520-1234. What do you think? Um, I thought he did great last night, and as far as people saying he needs to move on from the 2020 election, um, that's, if you look at midterms, he wasn't on the ballot, and people still cheated. So I think that he doesn't need to move on. I think the legislators need to get the job done and get things going. I also think that he has moved on. If people pay attention to his uh, war room post, he posts at least two videos a day of what he's going to do in the future. And I also think that Ron DeSantis is not the guy. I think that... Uh, Amy, I'm staying focused on Donald Trump. Again, I'm in Switzerland, and I I rigorously... um, enforce the rule talk to me about what you're for not what you're against and so thank you for the call i really do i just want to hear now what you're for today i'm asking you what did you think of donald trump last night ron descent now I, i'll get chris christie's view of that i'll get tom emmer's view of that tom cotton's brett bears representative patrick McHenry. right now i want to talk to you peggy in florida what did you think of last night peggy hi peggy not posturing we can't hear you, Peggy. You got to speak up. I said he was not. He was not um, telling a lie. Our country's in terrible shape. He's not posturing. This. It, he was serious because we are in terrible danger, and I thought he was treated very rudely and not allowed to talk. Okay, Peggy. Walking. Thank you. One more, Tony in Colorado. What do you think, Tony? You've got thirty seconds. Hello, Tony. You're on. you got 30 seconds. Yeah, uh, thank you, Hugh. Um, I really appreciate Mr. Trump going on CNN to try to state his point of view. Uh, you know, when the man was in office, even the, even the Republican Party came after him with Paul Ryan resigning. Yeah, my, Tony, my Republican. question is, did it change your opinion of him last night? No, I'll vote for him all day, every day. All right, that's what I want to say. I don't think it moved the needle last night one way or the other. I just don't. But I'll continue to take phone calls, and my text messages are responding. Did last night's town hall change your opinion of Donald Trump or who you're going to vote for in the Republican presidential primary? That was a town hall for GOP primary voters, and what did they think about it? Uh, Donald Trump at the end of it. Stay tuned, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. I would do uh, numerous things. For instance, schools, we would harden, very, very much harden. And I also, I'm a very believer. I believe in teachers. I love teachers. I think they're incredible. And they love the children, not quite like the parents, but they love the children in many cases almost as much.
Welcome back, America. Hugh Hewitt live inside the Beltway. Uh, responses pouring in from my focus group, The Universe, uh, which can text me uh, from Steve in the 813. No change to my opinion. Trump did very well. Let me go to um, Chris in 727 land. He did remind me, former President Trump, what a tough negotiator he is. A pro. Dismisses the leverage the D's always use. Default. Classic Trump move. Attempt to shift focus to D's unwillingness to negotiate it. Um, so there is no change. Trump is not about to change at this point in his life. He's part promoter, part comedian, part provocateur, and through most hate to admit it, part genius. He's entertaining as a great way of saying things in a way that connects with blue-collar Americans. Sophisticated now, not so much. He remains a polarizing figure, and I still fear would lose a general. But who knows? Biden is beyond awful. I voted for Trump twice, but we'll vote for DeSantis in a primary probably. Uh, let's go to Richard in Kentucky. Good morning, Richard. What do you think? 1-800-520-1234. Blitzing a half hour of reactions from texters and callers. Richard? Uh, did not change uh, my opinion of Trump. I'm a mega Republican. I will vote for Trump again. And you are not Switzerland. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Richard, I am Switzerland. But... Uh, I wish you'd stayed on to tell me why you're not. You're always welcome to, to challenge that. Maybe my textures will. I'll ask them if I'm doing a good Im imitation of Switzerland. Uh, I got Chris Christie, Nick Haley, the former president's been on a couple of times, Ron DeSantis a couple of times, Vivek, Ramaswamy a couple of times. Tim Scott has not accepted the invite yet, but he's also in the exploratory committee. Mike Pence has not yet declared as well. Let me check the markets brought to you by Birch Gold. All right, HughGold.com. Gold went up yesterday to 2029, just a couple of bucks. 2029, the 10 year treasury went down to 3.42 as money continues to flow into the safest investments, gold and a 10 year treasury. The Dow was up, was down 30 points. The SP was up 18. The NASDAQ was up 126%, 1%. That's mostly Amazon put on a giant gorilla move yesterday, $3.51 up. 3.35% move, far in excess of the market. Google also only up 1.62% meta. So it wasn't just a cycling in, something happened. I don't follow close enough, but Amazon picked up. But gold, just a tick up. Uh, the 10-year goes down, gold goes up, and it remains the fact that gold stays ahead of inflation. So if you want the money you're going to save right now to be worth what you put into the vault, physical precious metals with birch gold, that's what you buy. Krugerrands, you buy um, maple leaves, you buy American Eagles. Those are one ounce pure gold, and you have birch gold. Do not buy collectibles unless you're a numinist. You know, you just don't, you're up against people who know too much. You can't win that game. But everybody knows what the cost of gold is when you buy it. You know what your basis is. It's in your IRA. It can grow over time. It's your reservoir against hyperinflation or continuing inflation. Now, the pace of inflation slowed a little bit yesterday, but not enough to really make people feel great about this. Let me also remind you over at the top of HughHewitt.com, Angel Tree banner is up. We're getting ready to start next week to really push hard, sending kids to camp. $200 sends one kid to camp. Some of these kids haven't been in three years because capacity was limited last night. They're way open this year, way open, way, 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 way open. COVID is over. Kids are out back doing what kids do, and we need your help to do it. That's the banner at the top of HughHewitt.com, Angel Tree Prison Fellowship. Generalissimo, uh, did you stress eat during the debate last night, uh, during the town hall last night? or did No, you but, I've, I've, but you know, this morning it would have been fun to, uh, to stress eat after, after redoing all the audio. Well, MyPhDWeightLoss.com keeps you from stress eating. It actually does. I, so that's, I actually, that's the key. you don't it's get a, hungry on this. On this they're a sponsor, and so they don't want to hear you complaining about redoing. They want to hear you tell the people about why you actually lost weight on myphdweightloss.com. Well, I lost weight because I did the program. I actually, you know, quit eating bad foods, ate good foods, and behaved myself. I mean, it's it's really not rocket science if you just do what you're supposed to do. 864. 644. 1900. That's 864-644-1900. A lot of people ask me about this, and they really want to know if you lost 50 pounds. And I say, yeah, I really did lose 50 pounds. I really Look did. You actually, so you actually saw me. Well, I've got pictures of you. You actually saw me. I, I was got actually, lots of... 
I got lots of photographic evidence. I was actually in Studio West. Uh, and, and it works. Yes. It does work. But I don't go to Studio West. I'm mostly in Studio North and Studio Beltway. But you um, were when you taught. Yeah, that's true. Okay, time to, my PhDWeightLoss.com, great sponsor. Go to it. Time for Relief Factor. Got to get ready for Chris Christie. He's always a brawler, and uh, so it'll be fun. I carry in curcumin, resveratrol, and omega. Right there. And I, I did uh, five miles yesterday after the show. Beautiful day inside the Beltway. I mean, just a beautiful day. We're having our two weeks of spring. That's why I'm here. Then I'm running up to the brother-in-laws, getting out of town, moving out, and going to Studio North. And I am uh, I'm very ready, but I'm not ready for the Beach to Beacon 10K. Because I, I, I walked yesterday. I trundled. My knee barked a little bit back last night, but it's still it's okay this morning. Uh, downstairs, upstairs to the studio, and it's fine. Everything is good. And that's because ReliefFactor.com is kicking in. And I want you to give it a try, and I want you to come back after the break. Chris Christie is going to join me to do a post game on the uh, Donald Trump town hall last night. The sort of thing you do, you get up early to do, if you're running for president. He hadn't declared yet, but we'll see. We'll see. Don't go anywhere. Hugh Hewitt. Chris Christie is next.
Welcome back, America. You hear it inside the Beltway. Joined by former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. Good morning, Governor. Welcome back to the Hugh Hewitt Show. Thanks for having me, Hugh. Good morning. What was your reaction to last night's town hall? Well, look, uh, you know, I looked, I listened to it, um, and there were two reactions that I had. I mean, the first one was that Donald Trump lives in the past um, and, and doesn't really spend a whole lot of time talking about America's future. Um, and it also struck me that uh, it, was, it was almost like deja vu for me, spending eight years in the New York and Philadelphia media market. Um, you know, you're, if you're a Republican, you're going to get knocked around by the media, um, and that's the way it goes. And I don't think we do much uh, winning by complaining about it. We just plow through it and talk about our issues and let people hear about our issues. And I don't think he did that very well last night. The most significant policy position taken last night was his uh, throwdown on the debt limit, meaning it would be mostly psychological if we did not raise the debt limit and that eventually we're going to have to breach the debt limit unless serious $5 trillion of spending is done. Your reaction to his marker, which I think was intended for the House Republicans more than anyone else. Well, I, look, my reaction is, um, you know, <laughs> Dr. Hill myself, I mean, he did more to, to, uh, uh, to add to that problem um, during his four years as president um, than any president until Joe Biden. Um, and the two of them both uh, should be thinking about what they've done to add to the, the, the absolute fiscal mess that we have here in the country. And, and so I, I love, and, and, and he said, I, I love using the... Uh, the debt limit as, a, as leverage when I'm not president, but I'm totally opposed to it when I am. Um, you know, look, uh, he called himself the king of debt when he ran in 2016, and the problem is that we're now seeing the ramifications of that. Enormous inflation that kills the spending power of the American people. What did you make of the uh, answers on abortion? Because I understood what he was saying. I don't think necessarily Caitlin Collins did, which is, it depends. It depends on what the legislation says. How did you think of it? Well, look, I, you know, it's much different than what he was saying in 2016 and 2020. And this is a quandary for people who don't, aren't principled on the issue of abortion, Hugh. Um, you know, when, when Roe versus Wade was there to block anything meaningful, from being done at the state level. Everybody had, you know, beer muscles talking about this issue. Now that you can do something at the state level and the federal level for that matter, um, you know, everyone starts to get a lot more nuanced about it. You know, my view on it is very clear. You know, we for 50 years have said this is a state issue. It's a state issue, should be a state issue uh, for states to decide themselves. I think it continues to be a state issue. And the state that in the first in the first shot at this, the states should have the first shot at deciding what they want a person to look like. And then once we see what the patchwork of the United States looks like, then we can make a decision about whether the federal government uh, gets involved if they're able. So is your answer any different? If, if the Congress passes a, a national abortion bill, which they have the ability to do under a variety of of constitutional authorities, even in a government of limited and enumerated powers. Let's say they get something that's constitutional to your desk. Do you accept the results of the legislative process, or do you veto it and say it's for the states? Well, I think, you know, Hugh, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I don't think they're going to build a consensus in the Congress to do it. Um, but I would tell you this, what I want first to see is what the states are willing to do. We've been arguing that for 50 years. Let's see what the states are willing to do on this issue. Um, and I, I just don't believe I, I, Congress, Congress can't come to a consensus on almost anything. You really think they're coming to a consensus on abortion? Again, it's an interview, not a debate. Like the, I have a different approach. You know I just ask questions, Governor, so let me ask some more. Um, he said about <laughs> Ukraine that it was not prudent to call Putin a war criminal. Do you agree with him? No. No, I think he's a coward, and I think he's a puppet of Putin. I really do. I, I think, I don't know why, I say the truth, I can't figure it out, but there's no other conclusion to come to. He wouldn't say last night that Ukraine should win the war. I mean, I was stunned. It was To me, it was the most stunning moment of the debate. If you won't say that you think Ukraine should win the war, 
Um, I, I don't know where you, you stand with Putin. And, you know, to say that he could, he could settle it in 24 hours is, is the same kind of uh, bravado that we heard eight years ago when he said that he would build the wall across the entire border of Mexico and the United States and Mexico would pay for it. And, and we have a wall that's about a, a fifth of what we need um, after his presidency. And Mexico hasn't pay, paid their first peso to us yet. So I, when you were listening last night to the exchanges on Carol v. Trump, uh, you have said on the show before, if you had a, a client you would not let who was being investigated by three different jurisdictions and sued by a couple more, you wouldn't let them on the air. But, of course, if you're running for president, you have to go on the air. What did you make of his responses to the questions about Carol v. Trump? Well, look, I, I, I just don't find them credible. I don't find it credible for him to say he doesn't know the woman. And, and I mean, I just, I don't find that credible, Hugh. I mean, this guy must be the most unlucky guy in the world. Women who he's never met and he doesn't know continue to accuse him of things. I don't think we need somebody that's unlucky as president of the United States. I, if he had showed he, up in the, in the courtroom and it said, I own the Grand Central Plaza. I walk into Bergdorf Goodman, and somehow we end up in a dressing room. Did you find that persuasive in sowing doubt, Chris Christie? I did not. All right. Why not? Well, because I don't find anything he said about this credible. He starts off by saying he doesn't know her. I mean, that's what he says every time to you. I mean, we have to put this in context. Every time there's a problem, he barely knows the person. You remember how many times he said that in his administration about people who worked for him. As soon I'm, as I'm not sure he went, knows you anymore, Governor. So I, I, I yeah, I've only <laughs> known him for 22 years. You know, he barely knows me either. I mean, that's why I didn't find it credible, Hugh. It's where he starts. What did um, you think of the audience? The audience was so interesting to me last night. It's just half, 100. percent You know, if you run against him, you got to deal with that audience. What would you say to him about him? I would just continue to talk about the facts. And I think it's different when someone who's a Republican talks about it than when Caitlin Collins talks about it. I think that's marked. It's significantly different. And, and I think you'd have to do it um, continuously, honestly, directly. And you need, to, you need to confront them. I think what people need to think about is if you watch that town hall last night and the monologue um, that it became um, where, you know, he just continues to talk no matter whether, you know, what's going on. That's why he needs to be challenged on the debate stage. Now, I want to, uh, have you made your decision yet? You got another week to go. You told me last week, two weeks, you got one week to go. When are we going to hear something? Well, it's about a week. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know? You know, I don't do math. I'm a lawyer, Governor. I don't do math. <laughs> so, what, with me, what? Too, so it might be two weeks. Who knows? You know, I'm not, I'm not going to do <laughs> All right. The House, a couple other issues. The House Oversight Committee lays this out yesterday. $10 million in LLCs, money flying around from Romania, Ukraine, and China. My goodness, but it stinks to high heaven. What do you think? Look, I think, I think exactly what you think. I think it stinks to high heaven. And I don't think anybody should doubt this simple fact that at a minimum, Joe Biden's family has been living off Joe Biden's uh, influence for decades. And whether it's uh, Jim Biden or whether it's Hunter Biden um, and a, a number of other Bidens uh, that are, are, are in the family, uh, they live off of Joe Biden's influence and he has let them do it, um, if not uh, encouraged them to do it. And I think it's something that needs to be looked at even more closely, not only by congressional oversight, but also by law enforcement. You know, the investigation of Hunter Biden's in a couple of different jurisdictions, not Maine Justice. But Maine Justice had a meeting with Hunter Biden's lawyers. I've had a couple of hot takes on that from former prosecutors. What do you make of that, Governor Christie? You are a former United States attorney. My guess on this one is because it's in a couple of jurisdictions that uh, when they got some, usually, you know, when that, ha when that happens is when they get a phone call, they mean in defense lawyers, get a phone call saying there's an indictment coming. Um, and they say, well, can we have a meeting to talk to you before there's any indictment? That's my experience of the when we would usually have one of those meetings. Um, and maybe justice is doing it because it's multiple jurisdictions. But I think what probably triggered it is the call saying, you know, your guy's a target. 
um, we're getting ready to finish up here. And they say, well, let's let us have a meeting first. That's my yep. guess as to what's going on, but we'll see. I did not discuss this with Governor Christie before he came on, but that is exactly what other former prosecutors have told me. Target letter received or phone call. The lawyer say, can we come in and narrow this or discuss it and what the idea, get some idea of what's coming so they can brief their client. That's not in, unethical. It's not inappropriate. It happens all the time, right, Governor? Every, uh, in every major case, you send out either a target letter or a phone call saying to uh, the, the intended uh, uh, defendant, Hey, um, this is coming. Do you want to? Usually, you know, as you know, it's do you want to come in and testify before the grand jury? Um, that answer is almost universally no. Um, but the defense lawyers use it as an opportunity to ask for a meeting and to try to get an idea of what's coming, um, and sometimes even to negotiate a plea before that. It did not come up except tangentially last night when Donald Trump brought it up. Hunter Biden's laptop, the 51 intelligence officers or former intelligence officers who signed that. What do you think of that letter now? I think of it now when I thought of it then, which was it was politics. Um, and, and I think it was politics then. Uh, and I think that what was going on at that time with Hunter Biden, the Hunter Biden laptop issue, whether it was what Twitter did with the New York Post um, or the, the 51 people signing the letter. Um, they were against Donald Trump, and they wanted to try to make sure that they suppressed that issue. Uh, so I think now is exactly what I thought then. And so when we see an indictment of Hunter Biden, which I think we'll see, do you think it's going to be income tax evasion or any, or conspiracy or, or uh, minor issues such as misdemeanors for not declaring uh, felonies on a gun application? My guess is it's the former. Um, I would think it's going to be involving income tax evasion and other issues surrounding that, whether it turns out to be uh, wire or mail fraud or money laundering along with income tax evasion. It'll be some combination of those. Will they also throw in the gun issues? I'm not sure, but that wouldn't typically be what a federal prosecutor would do. And given what you saw about the Comer thing, very quickly, Governor, do you think Joe Biden is in legal peril? I think members of his family are, and I think we're going to see whether he will be or not as the evidence develops. Governor Chris Christie, thank you as always. Very responsive to an early morning request, and I appreciate it. Don't go anywhere, America. More of your phone calls, more of your reactions when we return to The Hugh Hewitt Show. The Hugh Hewitt Show is now available on TV. Go to SalemNewsChannel.com or download the app. You can also watch on Roku and Fire Stick. Salem News Channel, the antidote to the mainstream media.
Welcome back, America. To you, are joined now from Israel by Dr. Michael Oren. There is a fight raging uh, today, Dr. Oren. What is going on in Israel today? Well, going on in Israel today, there's a uh, talks about a ceasefire uh, after about 800 rockets were fired at us. Uh, mortar shells continue to fall along the uh, the Gaza border, uh, and nobody knows whether this is the this, the calm before the storm uh, and whether it's going to spiral out of control. The big question you is whether Hamas joins the the fight. Uh, right now, there's been a fight between the Palestinian, Palestine Islamic Jihad, which is a wholly owned and operated expansion of Iran, and Hamas, which is merely supported by Iran. Hamas does not want to enter the fight. It has about 20,000 Palestinians from Gaza enter Israel every day for work. They don't want to jeopardize that very important source of income for the Strip, which is going through also the economic uh, dislocations. But Hamas is under tremendous pressure uh, to join, especially if uh, Israel keeps on uh, striking uh, Gaza and people in, in the Gaza are saying, how come you know the Palestine Islamic Jihad is standing up for us and you're not? Uh, tremendous pressure. So it, everything hangs in the balance right now. Anything from the north yet from Hezbollah? Nothing, nothing. And okay. you think that uh, Iran would not sit quietly while its uh, boys are literally getting knocked off in Gaza. Uh, we've now uh, eliminated at least four senior uh, leaders of PIJ, Palestine Islamic Jihad. Uh, I think the most interesting thing is happening politically internally <laughs> in Israel, and that is I keep on saying on this program it's always premature to uh, eulogize uh, Benjamin Netanyahu politically. Uh, this war, and it sounds horrible to say this, this mini war has been kind of a godsend for him. Uh, it has united his government around him. It has silenced the opposition. Uh, no protests right now about the reforms. And uh, as uh, Netanyahu looks forward to passing a state budget in the next two weeks, uh, he's, in, uh, he's in good shape. Ben Gavir, the uh, radical right, has ceased his opposition to the government, correct? So apparently he has taken this opportunity of a war with Gaza, some militants, to come back into the government. Am I right in that assessment? Yeah, all of the people who were sort of dissenting, because there were dissenters on all sides, the ultra-Orthodox, some members of his own Likud who felt he was, wasn't moving faster on the reforms, uh, Ben Gavir, who had, was, uh, was uh, abstaining from... Uh, from government votes uh, and disappearing into the Knesset, away from the cabinet meetings. Uh, everyone all of a sudden is rallying around the government. Again. Now, how long will it last? Um, maybe not so long, but long enough to pass that state budget, which is a huge hurdle for this government. Now, Dr. Oren, uh, would you, uh, my sense always is whenever there is a breakout of violence, whether it's from Gaza or Hezbollah, I'm very glad Netanyahu is running things. I just am. I think he's been here and done that before. Is that a general feeling in Israel, or is that an American uh, friend of Israel, not a Jew, looking at it and saying, I'm glad that guy's running that war? You know, i got to say this. You know, there's no empirical evidence on this. I can't point to statistics. Uh, but my guess is that uh, Israelis would prefer to have Netanyahu, who has done this how many times in the past? Right. Uh, and done it pretty well, than have someone who hasn't been tested, a rookie. And... Uh, and I, I, I got to tell you, honestly, I was thinking the same thing this morning. With all, you know, criticism I have of the government, criticism the way they've handled these reforms, uh, if someone's got to be managing the ship that, that when rockets are falling, I'm going to say that you're, you're better off with this guy than someone who's never sat in the driver's seat. Because you've got to make tough calls, right? Uh, there are 2.4 million people in Gaza. You're trying to kill four of them who are the leaders of Islamic Jihad, perfectly legitimate. They're terrorists. But you're going to have some civilian casualties as well. You've got to know exactly what to do and the capabilities of the military. I think Netanyahu knows this. It's not just that. You want to be able to strike PIJ without striking Hamas. And you want to give Hamas a, a little latitude uh, so it doesn't feel that it has to enter the fighting, that it can put up with this pressure uh, within Gaza. And we can, we can move on. And, and from Hamas's first fight, this is very cynical to say this, it's great because Hamas is willing to fight Israel to the last PIJ terrorist. Huh. Now, last question, Dr. Ryan. I, I started to watch uh, Fauda the last season, and it's, too, it just, it's so tense. Is it that way for the Israeli security forces? Is that real life? I mean, I, I'm watching the diplomat. By the way, I didn't know that the ambassador to the United Kingdom was so central to keeping the world safe. But uh, is, it, is Fauda true? Unlike, you know, the well, diplomat it, it, is not. I don't want to be a spoiler for the season, okay? But the most incredible thing, Hugh, is that the plot of this season of, of, of Fauda is exactly what's happening right now. Okay. And wow. it's spoiler, a little bit of spoiler. It's about a plot to fire rockets at Israel from Janine, and that's just what Islamic Jihad were planning to 
fire rockets from Janine. Well, it's a very, it's so intense. It is stomach curdling in, in the way that Jack Ryan, there is not anything like it. Diplomats, pretty, have you watched Diplomat yet, Dr. Dr. Oren? I have. They're too nice to Iran. I can't bear it. Well, they're not only too nice to Iran, but they're also, I mean, was that, it, it might be your job, actually, to, to do stuff like that, but it ain't our UK oh, ambassador, uh, yeah, right? It's me to watch it. It's me to watch it. It brings back to You know, people who wrote this, the same people who wrote West Wing, I actually know some of them, and uh, they are, basically, yeah. yeah. It's wonderful sets. It's terrific. It's just got nothing to do with reality. Michael Oren, follow him on Twitter at DR Michael Oren. Thank you. Stay safe. I hope all of Israel stays safe. 800 rockets. I, when I last looked, it was 400 rockets. So this is really a tense moment in Israel. I'm covering it all. I'm covering the town hall. I'm covering the Comer indictment. I'm going to come back with more on the Comer, not the Comer indictment, the Comer uh, report, which came out yesterday. Get some phone calls on that. And uh, House Whip Tom Emmer will be here, as will um, Patrick McHenry, chair of financial services on the debt ceiling showdown. There's a lot ahead. Don't go anywhere. I'm Hugh Hewitt. You're a listener. Stay right where you are. This hour of Hugh Hewitt starts right now on Salem News Channel. Good morning, America. Big town hall last night for Donald J. Trump in New Hampshire. The former president taking questions from CNN's Caitlin Collins in the audience. Did it change your opinion of Donald Trump? Did it change your plans on voting in the Republican primary? Talk to us. 1-800-520-1234. 1-800-520-1234. Connection to the Hugh Hewitt Show. You won't want to miss a minute. This hour of Hugh Hewitt is on Salem News Channel.
Morning, Glory America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. This hour, House Minority Whip, House Majority Whip, Tom Emmer of Minnesota joins me as he is the guy corralling the Republicans. I want to hear what he thinks about President Trump last night talking about the debt limit. I got a few polls of um, President Trump from last night. Uh, Probably the best is the inflation response. Cut number 25, please. Drill, baby, drill. We were energy independent. We were soon going to be energy dominant. And nobody had ever done what I did. We got oil down to $1.87. Actually, it fell lower than that in some cases. We had to save the oil companies that the price was getting. So we were doing incredibly. We had the greatest economy in the history of our country, probably the greatest economy in the history of the world. We were energy independent, soon to be energy dominant. We were going to be bigger than Russia and Saudi Arabia put together times two. We have more liquid gold under our feet than any other nation, any other nation. And these stupid fools ended it. And energy went from $1.87 and even lower for gasoline, for a car. They went from $1.87 to five, six, seven, eight, and even $9. And your electricity bills went through the roof, your heating bills went through the roof. And that's what started inflation, and it hasn't stopped because people are paying now for bacon and for eggs and for the two and three times what it was just a little while ago. We created the greatest economy in history. A big part of that economy was I got you the biggest tax cuts in the history of our country, bigger than the Reagan cuts, bigger than any... And, And also, Caitlin, also, as you know, we got the biggest regulation and regulatory cuts we, this place was rocking, and then we were given a gift from China, and China paid a big price. And let me tell you something. I took in hundreds of billions of dollars in taxes from China, but prior to COVID coming in, and then I rebuilt the economy again a second time. But we had, prior to COVID coming in as, as from China, from Wuhan, which I said it came from Wuhan. Everybody said, oh, you're wrong about that. You're wrong. It came from Wuhan. I said it right from day one. So... We had the greatest economy in the world. Here's the story. Uh, They made energy so high, and energy is all invasive. It is massive as an industry and as a cost. It lifted everything. If you made made donuts, if you made, no matter what you did, and we had inflation the likes of which I guess we haven't had, they said, for 52 years, but I think more than that. We had no inflation. We had the lowest energy prices we've had in decades. This country was rocking and rolling. And by the way, we had the most secure border in the history of our country. Mr. President, if you were... I would sit down... Now, the secure border thing, Joe Biden disagrees with. Cut number 14, the the, the current president, on the White House lawn yesterday. Cut number 14. How would you settle that war in one day? Because I'll meet with Putin. I'll meet with Putin. Cut 14. We've been for a number of years. We have to fully fund the border security effort. We have to fully fund... Look... The purpose of what we're doing now is making legal immigration more streamlined, illegal immigration shorter term and move, and food in a direction that people know that there's a legal way to get here and not a legal way. That's what's underway now. The, that, that makes no sense. It also denies reality. Uh, we have chaos at the border. We did not have chaos at the border at the end of the Trump administration. They made some missteps along the way. Family separation policy was a very bad idea. But building the wall was a very good idea. It needs to be finished. It needs to be finished. It's, it is the visible expression of the invisible resolve to control the border. And that's why we need to do it. Uh, the president also gave a speech yesterday um, about what the Republicans want to do. Cut number 15. He says he's going to take the funding, of that we, how we fund government, back to what the levels were in 2022, before the omnibus bill. Yeah, that's it. He knows what Kevin McCarthy wants to do. Take the funding levels back to 2022. And they were high and getting higher, and they have to go backwards and get smaller. Donald Trump last night on the debt and the default fear out there, cut number 23. It's psychological. It's really psychological more than anything else. And it could be very bad. It could be maybe nothing. Maybe it's a, you have a bad week or a bad day. But look, you have to cut your costs. 
we're, we're spending $7 trillion on, much of it on nonsense. $7 trillion on nonsense. That is, by the way, the reality. We have spent trillion. Some of it is good. I had a conversation with a senior former member of the, the Trump administration yesterday, and they are wholly approving of some of the CHIPS Act. The CHIPS Act is doing reshoring of chip production in Arizona and Ohio and other places. Very important. But it came with just gobs of wasteful spending. Gobs. Uh, also, Donald Trump on Russia and the Ukraine war. Cut 26. Will you suspend polarizing talk? of? If you were I would sit down. Let, let me just put it a nicer way. Uh, if I'm president, I will have that war settled in one day, 24 hours. How would you settle that war in one day? Because I'll meet with Putin, I'll meet with Zelensky. They both have weaknesses and they both have strengths. And within 24 hours, that war will be settled. It'll be over. It'll be absolutely over. Do you over. want Ukraine to win this war? Uh, I don't think in terms of winning and losing. I think in terms of getting it settled so we stop killing all these people and breaking down this, this country. So that's become a hot point. Uh, Chris Christie said on the show last hour that makes him a puppet of Putin. I don't know if you agree or not. Uh, this morning, I, I sent out a text to the Universe subscribers. They are the uh, friends and allies of Hugh, the Sochi of Hugh. And uh, that's the Latin term for friends and allies of Rome. And I got back this. Overconfident in 2020 didn't come out in the numbers that time. I would predict they will be out this time. Disappointed, no clips in the first half hour. Christie did not watch it either. Yeah, yes, we did. Uh, and I'm trying to get as many reactions as possible from people. But Robert in the 910, that is, that's just fine. Go ahead and... Fire away. I am doing it my way. Here's Donald Trump on gun restrictions, hardened schools, and arming teachers. Cut 22. I would do uh, numerous things. For instance, schools, we would harden, very, very much harden. And I also, I'm a very believer. I believe in teachers. I love teachers. I think they're incredible. And they love the children, not quite like the parents, but they love the children in many cases almost as much. Many of these teachers are soldiers, ex-soldiers, ex-policemen. They're people that really understand weapons. And you don't need 5% of the teachers would be more than you could ever have if you're going to hire security guards. But in addition to that, have security guards. Uh, you have to harden your entrances. You have to make schools safe. And you can make other places safe. But it is a big mental health problem in this country more than anything else. And remember, we have 700 million guns, 700 million. Uh, many people, if they don't have a gun, they're not going to be very safe. I mean, if they don't have a gun, it gives them security. Now, you need them for entertainment. You need them for hunting. You need them for a lot of different things. But there are people that if they didn't have the privilege of having a gun in some form, they, many of them would not be alive today. You know, there's a certain country that had a very strict policy on guns, very, very strict. Which country? And, uh, Brazil, okay. Brazil, uh, very strict. And the former president of Brazil, and the, the, the killing was incredible. They were walking into people's homes and killing people. They had no protection. He said, go out and buy guns. People went out and bought guns, and it went way down. The numbers went way down because they had security. If you look at Chicago, Chicago has the single toughest gun policies in the nation. They are so tough you can't breathe. New York, too, and other places also. All of those places are the worst and most dangerous places. So, so that's not the answer. That, that he does not want to increase gun regulation. He wants to harden schools. I think he hit uh, the sweet spot for Republican voters there. Um, from Marsha in the 304, no, my opinion did not change. I asked about, did your opinion train to my thousands of tech subscribers and universe members? Did your opinion change on Donald Trump and the results last night? No, my opinion did not change, writes Marsha. Water over the dam. We already knew he wasn't a perfect putt person. None of us are. This was so long ago. I think she's referring there to Carol V. Trump. And far away, probably didn't even happen. The only thing that matters is that his policies and leadership brought us to a much better place than we are right now as a country, and we need to get back to those policies. I still think we need Ron DeSantis to carry on those policies for a new generation, but I would support Trump if he's nominated. I believe, by the way, that is the general reaction of Republicans. I know what the general reaction of lefties are. They were losing their mind on Twitter last night. I'm not, yeah, I, I don't really, I'm, we're not going to get AOC to vote for Donald Trump or the Republican nominee ever. 
And if it isn't Donald Trump, they'll do the same thing to him that they did on Twitter last night to Donald Trump. They won't actually listen to what he said and respond to it. But Chris Christie thinks he's a puppet of Putin. Um, I, I, I just don't think it changed anybody's mind. 1-800-520-1234. Uh, coming back, Tom Emmer at the bottom of the hour. What did he think about the president talking about default and how close is it? Stay tuned. I am Hugh Hewitt inside the Beltway Live on this Thursday morning. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you by Prison Fellowship's Angel Tree Summer Camps. Click on the banner at HughHewitt.com.
Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Collecting reactions to last night's town hall with Donald Trump uh, from Robert in the 678. Actually, my opinion of DJT improved last night. He's going to move forward with his base and try to expand it. The substantive points he made were good as usual. Randy in Tennessee, what do you think, Randy? Hey, Hugh. Good morning. Hey, uh, good morning to you. Hey, you know, I was kind of worried that Trump might have been fading a little bit, so it actually did change my mind when I saw how well he did. I started saying, hey, this guy's still on his A game. The big thing that changed my mind, Hugh, was Chris Christie informing. I did not know that Trump was a coward and a puppet of Putin's. And now that the governor let me know that, you know, hey, man, I don't know if I can vote for a guy who's a coward, a puppet of Putin. And last week he told us that he doesn't care about America. And I'm like, man, I did not know that. So I well, yeah, G- Governor Christie is swinging from the, I think he's running. I think he's running. But, Randy, I'm, I just talked about Trump last night, not Governor Christie's reaction. Thank you, friend. Stephen in South Carolina, what would you think? I got to get to James Comer, but I'll take one more. Hey, good morning. It's always a pleasure. I think you're one of the smartest men on radio. It's Thank always you. a pleasure talking to you. Uh, I have a sister in Connecticut who does not vote Republican, and she saw the uh, the town hall with me. And you know what she told me 2024 is, is going to be all about for her? It's going to be gas, groceries, and the border. So, you know, she looks fancy. I, if I was Donald Trump, I do not show up to a Republican debate. To what? deal with a hatchet man a morally well you know i i, I, I do think you like yeah, that, that that you're, you're going off Stephen. here i just want to know what you thought okay okay thank you Stephen. thank you you got to listen to me when i talk back to you and i appreciate Stephen's calls but he's wound up i'm not interested in tactics or strategy for going for i was interested in last night james comer gave a press conference yesterday i just got to play three minutes of this cut number one a week ago, I sent a subpoena to the FBI for a form that a whistleblower has alleged is in the FBI's possession. We hope the FBI will be transparent and forthcoming and provide the Oversight Committee with the 1023 form we have subpoenaed. If they do, the committee will assess the form it has subpoenaed from the FBI and has been my practice. We will report to you only facts when they are verified and indisputable. This committee will not pursue witch hunts or string the American people along for years with false promises of evidence that is beyond circumstantial evidence as Representative Adam Schiff and the Democrats did for years. I trust the whistleblower. A subpoena from this committee is a powerful tool that I do not take lightly. The level of detail provided... Let's go down to cut number two where he gets into the specifics of the money trail. Cut number two. First... We want to discuss information the committee has learned since our last press conference in November. New information investigators have uncovered regarding the transfer of money from foreign entities to the Biden family. Many of the wire payments occurred while Joe Biden was vice president and leading the United States efforts in these countries. First instance. While Vice President Biden was lecturing Romania on anti-corruption policies, in reality, he was a walking billboard for his son and family to collect money. Hunter Biden and his associates capitalized on a lucrative financial relationship with a Romanian national who was under investigation for and later convicted of corruption in Romania. The Bidens received over $1 million for the deal. And 16 of the 17 payments to their associates' account that funneled the Biden's money occurred while Joe Biden was vice president. In fact, the money stops flowing from the Romanian national soon after Joe Biden leaves the vice presidency. This is a pattern of influence peddling. This appears separate from any payment Hunter received from his work connecting this individual now, the Donald Trump town hall has been scheduled for a month. I do not know why, and apparently House Republicans still do not understand, if you step on your own story, the media is not going to generally help you out of the squash. And so they stepped on their own story. They put it out on the morning. And so today's newspapers, all of them, all of them are Trump-heavy because that's newsworthy. 
what happened last night was newsworthy in many respects. I don't want you not to see the Comer audio. I do not want you not to hear it, but it, it's very hard when the GOP comms folks just don't get the basic rule of comm. Do not step on your own story, which they did by putting it out yesterday. ReliefFactor.com is a sponsor of this show. I don't step on my sponsors either. I tell you about my sponsors. And the FCC requires that, but I tell you anyway, ReliefFactor.com, it's the ReliefFactor.com studio. And if I, if I could, I'd ask all my uh, listeners entirely, how many of you have tried ReliefFactor.com after I've asked you three times a day for, I don't know, they've been a sponsor for 10 years, so that's 200 shows a year, 600 asks, 6,000 asks. How many of you have not yet tried ReliefFactor.com but are hurting, complaining, and somehow not yourself? I did five yesterday, and I've eased off and doing it every other day for a while because don't want the need to go back to bongo, and it's fine. It's great, and it was a pretty good, pretty good clip. Didn't slow down. Went, 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 went. So I'm telling you, relieffactor.com. Sometimes you have to double down, use it twice a day. Mostly it's once a day, but give it a try. 1995 relieffactor.com. I'll be right back, America. Tom Emmer is the House GOP whip. He joins me on the Hugh Hewitt Show.
Welcome back, America. There has been a large explosion in Milan, Italy. A van has blown up. It was packed with oxygen tanks. No word yet if it's terrorism. I'm joined by Tom Emmer, Congressman Extraordinaire, House Majority Whip from Minnesota. Good morning, uh, Whip Emmer. How do they call you? Do they call you, hey, here comes the whip. I mean, is that good? That's the nicest thing they call me. But yes, <laughs> good to be with you, Hugh. Good to have you back. Here comes the whip. Okay, uh, how did you get the 217 votes you needed to pass the uh, debt limit? Uh, you listen to everybody. The, uh, we got 222 members, Hugh. Uh, a lot of people were like, uh, oh, you need 230, you need 240 to, uh, you know, get people together. Actually, Republicans today with 222 members uh, takes 218 to pass things. Uh, Republicans today, I would argue, are more united than ever. We understand uh, who uh, is destroying America uh, and the, uh, the adversary is on the other side of the aisle. Uh, Republicans have been united under Kevin McCarthy's leadership, making sure that we uh, we fight back. So in terms of what the president responded last night, uh, former President Trump said the default issue is mainly symbolic. It might be a bad day, might be a bad week, seemed to downplay default happening. What's your view of a default and its consequences? Well, I, again, I, I understand he's running for the uh, the top office, so he's going to do what he's going to do. But I could not disagree with uh, our former president more. I, I think the uh, default is not on the table. House Republicans have literally uh, taken that off the table by passing what would be a transformational bill that the White House uh, can't respond to, at least not yet. I think the president and the people uh, literally that are running the White House around him are uh, still busy trying to figure out how to deal with this because they've lied about what's in it, Hugh. They try to say that it uh, has all these cuts. These are spending reforms that would save this country roughly $5 trillion over the next 10 years, would save close to a trillion dollars in the very first year uh, with some very basic things, right? Uh, just uh, going back to 2022 baseline spending levels, uh, these guys claim that's a 22% cut. Well, that's interesting, Hugh. That's just four months ago. And by the way, those spending levels were set by Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi. Uh, and then you cap it over the next 10 years. Oh, we lost the connection. Okay, we'll call him back. Uh, I want to follow up on that because it is nonsense. What Karine Jean-Pierre and the president are saying about the Republican plan is complete and utter nonsense. And Tom Emmer was just warming up. He's back now. Representative Emmer, I was just saying, you are completely right. What the president says the House bill does is not what the House bill does. Uh, we're not throwing veterans out on the street, right? That's what Corrine Jean-Pierre seems to say we are doing. Well, she, she really, uh, I, I, I have things I could say about that uh, uh, voice of the, uh, the White House. But no, uh, it's just an outright lie. I, there's no other way to say it. We could use a nicer word and say they're being very disingenuous. But there is no Republican that is going to cut veterans' benefits. In fact, you know, after the VA uh, under uh, Minnesotans' leadership, uh, Dennis McDonough, uh, they put out a DCCC press release in response to uh, the debt ceiling. It's completely false. It's loaded with, uh, with lies. Uh, the fact of the matter is, I think next week you'll get the Milcon VA bill that will be voted on on the House floor next week or the week after. Uh, Republicans are not going to cut veterans. Republicans are going to protect veterans. Republicans are going to protect our defense. Republicans protect the uh, uh, men and women that wear the uniform and protect us every day. Uh, completely the opposite on the other side of the aisle. And the good thing about it, Hugh, uh, people like you are talking about it. You have uh, a large group of people that listen to you. More importantly, uh, these people underestimate the American people. The American people are smarter than these, uh, you know, Joe Biden and uh, these uh, Democrats, Chuck Schumer. Uh, the cartoon character from the uh, Senate. It, it, Americans are smarter than these people. Uh, given yeah, last names. night, the former president said he had to negotiate with Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer over the debt limit. And he was basically saying, I'm, I'm compacting here. It's all theater. But, you know, if it's theater, we got to come to the end of the play. Joe Biden's got to send some people with the ability to negotiate. Has that happened? I No, it has not. I think uh, we're going to know a lot more tomorrow afternoon. Uh, our speaker, Kevin McCarthy, has another meeting with the, uh, with the president and whoever is representing him. Let's be clear. Uh, Chuck Schumer has nothing to do with the negotiation, absolutely nothing. 
Chuck Schumer, uh, our speaker, has said to him, Chuck, uh, if you can pass a bill out of the Senate on a debt ceiling, do it. And then we can go to conference. And the bottom line is Chuck Schumer can't pass anything out of the Senate. In fact, the only thing they've really done of any significance over the U.S. Senate this year is declare March uh, maple syrup month. So this is going to be between Kevin McCarthy and Joe Biden or whoever is representing Joe Biden. Uh, and your question is a valid one. We don't know who that is yet. Uh, I suspect they'll find out tomorrow. Now, uh, let's not deprecate maple syrup, uh, Whip Emmer. But uh, <laughs> later, later, McConnell has come out and said exactly what you said. This has got nothing to do with me or Chuck Schumer. This is between President Biden and Speaker McCarthy. We have divided government. Did that? Did the did the speaker come back? I haven't talked to him since. And give you any sense of whether or not President Biden is actually engaged with the details? I don't think he is. I don't actually think he has the capacity to engage with the details. No, I, it, the speaker came back and said it was a uh, it was a frustrating meeting. Uh, the uh, president did not. Uh, he he tried to carry the talking points that you're cutting, and and the uh, speaker had to tell him where, uh, Mr. President, tell me where in our bill it says we're cutting. Uh, yes, we're going to have to make hard decisions, but this is about making sure that uh, the country doesn't default. And then the president, according to our speaker, uh, kept conflating the budget with the debt ceiling. And uh, our speaker had to keep reminding him, uh, Mr. President, the budget has nothing to do with the debt ceiling. The budget is a top line spending number. Uh, we're talking about, uh, you know, protecting America from a default that, quite frankly, could be very devastating uh, to uh, our position. So, uh, so you know, it was a frustrating meeting, to say the least, but I think that tomorrow will be a better meeting. This does bother me, Representative Emmer, which is the president repeatedly conflates the debt, $31.4 trillion, and the deficit, which he has not brought down. They're simply not uh, washing the country down with money anymore in the CHIPS Act or the uh, infrastructure out of the Inflation Reduction Act or the Green New Deal. Does he actually understand? I mean, does he remember that they're different? <laughs> Those are two different questions. Does he understand and does he remember? Yeah. Uh, first off, I don't think he ever understood. I, I just don't think uh, our president was, uh, you know, I think he came to uh, Congress saying they told me there would be no math. I don't think he uh... lost him again. Dog on it. Oh, well, you know, when you're. Um... Run around the hill at this time in the morning, and uh, uh, Tom Emmer gets to work before anybody else does, and he leaves last. But then he always calls back, too. He's back again. I, I just said I, you get to work before anybody else, and you leave last. So I gather your cell phone's not so good up on the hill. I don't understand it. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting on the street corner, Hugh. It must be the Chinese and TikTok that keep dropping this call. Yeah. But let's go back to the debt and the deficit. We, we just got to right. get people educated. It's not about the deficit. It's about the debt. That is exactly right. Right now, we're trying to take care of the budget. With the debt ceiling, with the spending reforms, this government is spending $1.29 for every dollar we take in. First, you've got to balance the budget. Once you do that, Hugh, then you've got to move on to the debt. We've got $32 trillion in debt, and we're going to have to create an economy that will help us grow out of it. You control your spending and you pay off your debt and you preserve this country, not only for this generation, but for generations of freedom loving Americans to come. Now, do you believe that the June one day is uh, is a real deadline? Janet Yellen put it out there. I just don't believe her. I don't I don't know how you can believe anything Janet Yellen says. Uh, in fact, sadly, I just don't think I don't think she's up to the job. No, I don't know that June one is going to be the date. But uh, Hugh. We might as well plan on it. Well, if if that's the case, they better send near a tandem with a red red marker and get to work. What I don't think people understand is that staff has to drill down on this stuff. And I know you guys have staff who are ready to do that and get to where the the big two, the speaker and the president, can make some bottom line decisions. But I don't think the staff work's been done at the White House. I don't know if anyone's at home, Tom. No, that that's accurate. I mean, let's be very clear to your listeners. There is only one group that has been working since the beginning of the year, and that's Kevin McCarthy, the Speaker of the House, and the new House Republican majority. I mean, we have been working ever since that, uh, what do we call it, the knockdown, drag out uh, speakers race, right. which actually was very healthy for this country and for our uh, Republican uh, group. 
But this is the only and, and Kevin McCarthy's ready to to uh, get the deal done. He has the research. His people have done the work. But I can't say much for the other side. All right, I'm going to talk to uh, Chairman McHenry a little bit later about banking. So I'm going to ask you about the Comer committee yesterday. Uh, Representative Comer laid out. Chris Christie agreed with me. This stinks to high heaven. What is in that banking uh, records? Any significant interest from legacy media, anything approaching the interest they had in the Steele dossier, which was made up, as opposed to these bank records, which are very, very real. (laughs) Yes, they are. I mean, you're talking about public corruption at a level that uh, we haven't seen in maybe ever. Uh, The uh, Biden family, what Jamie Comer from Kentucky has done is he's got four uh, banks out of 12. You're talking about millions of dollars already that he has shown the Biden uh, uh, family literally is selling influence. Uh, There are shell companies that they funnel all of this in. And Jamie was telling me yesterday, you realize two grandkids uh, in the Biden family have benefited financially. You've got to ask one of these 21-year-old grandkids, why is somebody putting $100,000 into your account? Yeah, I... uh, uh... Whip Emmer, when I saw that, and I talked about it with Christie because he's a prosecutor, every bill has an invoice. Every deposit should have an invoice. Is there a paper trail? Is the IRS on this thing? Because it's just too much money to slosh around in LLCs. I mean, I've only had one LLC my entire life, and I've got an invoice for everything, right? This is not how people do business unless they're crooked. One minute. No, I, it, literally, uh, the IRS, I don't think, has been looking into it. But I don't think the Biden family and the White House expected Jamie Comer to go to different uh, uh, people within this scheme who don't have the ability to afford high priced lawyers and hide behind this. And Jamie and his committee, Hugh, they got the receipts. So they have the accounts and the receipts and only four of 12 accounts so far. I am. I'm watching. I don't like it that they scheduled on the same day as the town hall. That's like comms 101. But you can work with them on that. Do not step on your own story. Tom Emery from Minnesota. Thank you, Tom. Don't go anywhere, America. I'll be right back. Jim Talon is next. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you in part by Ph.D. Weight Loss and Nutrition. Go to myphdweightloss.com to learn more.
Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Jim Talent is, of course, former senator from Missouri. Always a pleasure to see you. Senator, did you watch the town hall last night? I was out, You, I did not watch it. That's why I watched the Hugh Hewitt show in the morning. To catch well, up. I'm frustrated because China didn't come up. Yeah. I mean, I just I can't believe it's not the first and the second and the third question, but that is a choice every every interviewer makes. How important is it for us to realign the American media onto what matters, Jim? Yeah, it's pretty essential, you, and this is the major national security threat of our time and will be for decades to come. And we have a flashpoint that we're looking at in Taiwan. I mean, look, it would not shock me to get up any morning and to see that a crisis has, is beginning that could result in a conflict over Taiwan. And you know what that means because you've interviewed Mike Gallagher and others about the war games. I mean, that's that's not gonna be us deciding whether to send missiles to Taiwan over the course of a year. That's gonna be American forces in Indo-PACOM being involved. You know, Senator, I, I've been reading this book, The Sleepwalkers by Sir Christopher um, Clark, uh, Oxford Regis Professor of History, and it's the definitive study of 1910 to 1914. In July, in, in June of 2014, when the Archduke, the successor to the heir, was assassinated, the Kaiser was on his yacht, right, in a yachting race, and no one thought it was going to happen. And it, we, I feel like we're sleepwalking right now. I feel like we slept, walked through all the key questions last night. The key question is China. They did get to Ukraine. What did you make of the president's responses on Ukraine? Uh, oh, you, well, did, you I, haven't seen him yet. I, I haven't seen it yet, you. Um, look, I, I, I think there's a good chance Ukraine would not have happened if President Trump had been president. At the same time, no, I don't think he could solve it in 24 hours. Uh, but I think the, the credibility of America's leadership in the world would have been stronger. And he might have been able to prevent it. I think that's probably true for anybody who was competent. But, you know, after Afghanistan... <clears throat> After uh, Joe Biden submitted a defense budget that was a cut in terms of inflation, you know, after uh, abandoning the Abraham Accords and starting up the negotiations with Iran, I mean, again, America's credibility was at a low point. And so, you know, when you have that, you have more conflict around the world. So let me let me conclude with this, Senator. I just talked to Tom Emmer about the debt yeah. limit. The president said last night, and I'm I'm con. Uh, 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 packing this down to its essence. Doesn't really matter if we default. It's symbolic. Might be a bad day. Might be a bad week. Tom Emmer said there isn't going to be a default. But, you know, if Joe Biden doesn't do anything, there's going to be a default. And the president basically said the Republicans don't blink. What's your advice to the Republicans? Well, I mean, I'm a little bit concerned. I love the fact that they passed a bill, you, uh, and I think it's given them leverage. He has to talk with Biden. I don't think Biden has any intention of coming to an agreement. What I would like to see us do is focus more attention on the Senate's inability to pass a bill. In other words, if these negotiations were not going on, the question would be, well, what is Chuck Schumer going to do in the Senate? Because the Democrats can't pass anything there. They can't pass a clean, they can't get to 50 votes, much less 60. And so I think what, what we have to see what happens if these negotiations break down and the attention focuses on the Senate's inability to pass a bill. At that point, if, I think the yeah. If we were serious, wouldn't Schumer get with McConnell pass something to get to conference, something on which to negotiate before the deadline? Right. They would do that if they were serious. But I think what Biden wants is to break McCarthy and the Republicans down. I don't think he can do that, in part because they've passed a bill. In other words, they've passed legislation which will prevent a default. It's the ball is now in the Senate's corner to do something. Now, if Biden can try and motivate the Senate, but if, if it fails at this point, it's because the Senate hasn't been able to pass a bill. All right. Last question has to do with the Comer report yesterday, the Oversight Committee. Yeah. Uh, $10 million in LLCs, payments to the Biden family. Which, What is your reaction to this? 16 uh, limited liability companies. Well, listen, this is all of a piece with classic Chinese influence operations. I mean, they funnel money 
to officials that they've targeted as important or family members of officials they targeted as important. And the point of it is to buy influence and get leverage points in the government of the United States, including local governments, by the way, you. So that's as soon as I saw this, and this, of course, was some time ago, it has all the classic earmarks of a Chinese influence operation. And his family just took the money. I mean, it's like they, they had no idea of the risk involved. Do, so do you know have, that every everyone who got that money has got to have declared it on their tax return or violated the tax law? Undeclared income is a big deal, Jim Talbot. Yeah, there's exactly. There's of course there's a question as to as to what aspects of it, if any, were illegal. I mean, these Chinese influence operations don't always, as you know, engage in illegal activity. But yes, tax issues. Another issue is, do you declare it on financial disclosure reports, particularly if you're the then vice president, right? Did it show up there? So there's a lot of issues like uh, all of that involved in it. And uh, I don't have a lot of confidence, I don't know about you, that the Biden Justice Department is vigorously and robustly investigating this. And then the Foreign Agent Registration Act. I mean, there's yes. uh, that was an IO, no smoking gun, but a lot of smoke yesterday. That's what exactly. I say. Uh, right. Jim Talent, good to see you as always. Follow him on Twitter, at Jim Talent. Go to the Bipartisan Policy Center for his latest work. Come back, Senator Cotton, and more next hour on The Hugh Hewitt Show. Yeah, well, I haven't seen him in a while, but yeah, I know. He's... Oh, my gosh, that's nice of him to say. Oh, I, you know, I didn't know you replaced him. I, I, I feel bad about that. Okay. So, Dwayne, where are you? Uh, I have a few extra minutes today because my normal interview was pushed back to 720. What what uh, do you have any plan? Uh, what, what are your plan? I mean, you're getting more and more active yourself in the, uh, you know, in the in the political and policy ecosphere and writing on it. I mean, you're not. Are you are you planning just to continue in this same rhythm? Or are you Right. Mm -hmm. This hour of Hugh Hewitt starts okay, right so now on Salem News Channel. Good morning, America. Big town hall last night for Donald J. Trump in New Hampshire. The former president taking questions from CNN's Caitlin Collins in the audience. Did it change your opinion of Donald Trump? Did it change your plans on voting in the Republican primary? Talk to us. 1-800-520-1234, connection to The Hugh Hewitt Show. I just very faintly, let me, 
It was the show's background that keeps me from hearing you. You won't want to miss a minute. This hour of Hugh Hewitt is on Salem News Channel. That's great. Yeah. Call me. Call me.
Morning, glory, America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Uh, I am inside the Beltway. My guest is Brett Baer. Good morning, Brett. How are you? Good morning, Hugh. I imagine special report tonight. We'll have to deal with some of last night's town hall. But I want to preface this by saying I've interviewed the president 30 times on the record. He is a difficult interview. And so I don't criticize hosts or anything like that. But what did you make of the president last night and the former president? And did he change anybody's mind about him? Well, interesting. I mean, I think that um, here's, here's the bottom line is that there are two campaigns that are very happy. One is the Trump campaign uh, because he kind of dominated and had that audience in the palm of his hand and they were applauding and laughing. And it was in New Hampshire and, you know, they did it on CNN for an hour. And the other campaign is the Biden campaign uh, because they want to run against the former president. And the tweet that the president put out saying, do you want four more years of this fits into their narrative. And so both campaigns, I think, were very happy. Do I think substantively there were there was news? I think the biggest news was that he said we may have to default. As a yes, amen. That, exactly. Really, the I, I had to rewind it. Actually, I had to after he said it. I, I said, wait a second, did he just say that? And um, so I, I think that'll be there'll be some fallout for that. I think um, there were non-answers about uh, Ukraine and Russia, although he kind of navigated that fairly well, saying he wanted the killing to stop. Uh, and then he didn't they didn't pin him down on abortion, uh, which is interesting, considering, you know, he wanted to take credit for Roe v. Wade. So uh, there were elements of news in there. But I think for the most part, he dominated um, that space. And that's, as you know, uh, how he operates. It is a tough interview. Let's go back over those three, because Chris Christie was my guest in hour one. He said, and I quote, the president is a coward and quote, he's the president is Putin's puppet. Uh, I didn't draw those conclusions. I did draw the conclusion that the president never telegraphed, the former president never telegraphs what he would do until he has to do something. I kind of understood the abortion back and forth. I think Caitlin was asking about uh, an imaginary bill and Donald Trump does not commit beforehand to whatever might end up on his desk. Do you think that made sense to Republican primary voters? I actually do. I actually yep. do. I think there's a real sense of you're going down the wrong road uh, when Governor DeSantis signs the six-week um, ban. And they, I think there's a, a sense that you got to wait and see what you can negotiate and the best thing that you can do and where the country is and read the room. And, and actually that answer, is, as unsatisfying as it may be for definitive you know, number of weeks, or um, I, I think essentially it was signaling there was not going to be a federal ban and there might be legislation that looks at you know, a number of weeks, and then turned, which Republicans have not often done, to the extreme position, he said, was the fact that there would be no restrictions all the way up to birth. So um, it's a tough issue, but he navigated that. Yeah, two campaigns are happy, and the Right to Life movement is happy. Because he yeah. did not put a target up there to shoot at, he put up there uh, a negotiating position, which is, I don't think this is, uh, it, it, you know, who knows what comes to my desk. Secondly, the default. And you, I called that in the first segment. You called it too, Brett. I've never heard anyone talk that way about the, the national debt uh, being a default issue. Maybe it's a one day a week. What do you think Wall Street's going to do today? Anything? Or are they just going to put that down to the guy who's not in the Oval right now, which is what I think it is? Yeah, I think it's, you know, talk and it's not you know, it's not steering uh, Republicans uh, on that front. You know, McConnell says that there is going to be a deal. Uh, it's got to happen between Biden and McCarthy, and the country is not going to default. But it was jarring to hear the former president say that. You know, these are obviously bills that we have due. We've already spent that money. And um, I think it would raise a lot of eyebrows if, in fact, we go down that road. Uh, I think he's point was to be a negotiating standpoint and say, you know, we need to deal with the deficit and debt. That said, you know, this is also a former president who does not want to touch Social Security or Medicare um, in the big picture and goes after Ron DeSantis on that issue. Um, that's where your big drivers are in the uh, long-term economy. Now, I just had Whip Emmer on talking about the debt negotiations. Speaker McCarthy came back, told the leadership team, the president is not engaged. 
and there is no point person. I thought maybe Neera Tandon would, would have the Sharpie out and be down with the budget, but apparently not. Uh, uh, Brett, I don't know what, I have no idea what we're going to do here because, you know, ne- Trump negotiated with Pelosi, Obama negotiated with bon- Boehner. You negotiate when it's a divided government. Do you think it's going to happen? I mean, I'm heading up to Capitol Hill this morning and to have some conversations behind the scenes. Um, I'm really trying to get a sense of that, too. I've heard the same thing, that the president is not directly engaged. And at this point, this late in the game, um, that's that's an issue. And so they continue to say that they're going to get a deal, but uh, I don't see a blueprint out there for it as of yet. No, I, I want to conclude by talking about the Comer report yesterday, or the report of the House Oversight Committee. I just told Tom Emmer my complaint is that House Republicans have never learned comms 101, which is don't step on your story. If Donald Trump's going to be on town hall, why would you put out a report in the morning? It, it got like no traction this morning. But it's, it's an eye-opening mess of bank accounts, Brett. What did you take away from that presser and the report that accompanied it? Well, I mean, obviously we covered it and uh, have focused on it. Uh, other media organizations have not. And it's kind of surprising, Hugh, that, you know, if, if any other president uh, was in this position, I think there would be a lot of organizations that would be going, at least some of these nuggets that are significant, would be going down these roads of, of inquiry. I think there's, they're there. Uh, they have to land the plane uh, with all the evidence. Uh, but clearly it's compelling enough to raise some serious questions, and it'll be a part of the campaign. Now, to me, $10 million bucks goes into a dozen accounts. It goes out somewhere, and they said it goes out to the Biden family. My first question is to every member who got a check, did they declare the income? And Brett, you probably have an LLC. I do, and I've had one for 40 years. You know, it's just one uh, LLC, not 20, and that's a separate tax return. you got to declare the income, the origin, and any expenses. It's all got to be given to the IRS. Did you get a sense that they have cooperation from the IRS on this? I don't have a sense of that yet, but they do have these whistleblowers, um, and one of them is a 10-year tenured uh, IRS agent uh, officer. And um, so there may be some you know, steering behind the scenes on that front. I agree with you. You have to declare that. Not only that, but what was the service provided? Where, where is the business here? And yeah. um, That's what I, I got I asked think, yesterday by an accountant. Where's the invoice that the LLC sent to whatever, the Romanian, the Chinese, whoever? The, where's the invoice? for And, and what service? You know, lawyers don't get paid unless you send a bill. So there's right. something going on here. But, I, Brett, I do not know that we are any closer today than we were when the New York Post story was suffocated. That's probably true. And it's... Um, you know, I said last night with Britt Hume, it's, uh, you know, if a tree falls in the woods and no one is there, did it did it fall? And yes, it fell, but people have to hear it. And so I think to break through, there's going to have to be something more significant, although, you know, what they have so far is compelling. Brett Bear, I'll be watching tonight on Special Report because by then the aftermath of the town hall will have settled a bit and sorted, and we will have more on the Comer Report, and we will know more about Hunter Biden. Brett Bear, always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you, friend. I, um, I've got coming up Tom Cotton. I've got coming up Chairman Patrick McHenry, Chairman of the House Financial Services Committee. And I'm going to talk about the debt. I, I, and I know a lot of, I'm going to play some more clips from, for those of you who came in late from the town hall last night. First, let me tell you all that Andrew and Todd.com are out there working every day to get you the best deal if you're buying a house. Now, yesterday was a weird, weird day. All right, and 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 so I, I continue to return to the the underlying financial hebe jeebies because it you know normally there are patterns and you follow the patterns. Yesterday the Dow went down thirty, the S and P went up eighteen. That's a little bit weird. Nasdaq went up one hundred and twenty six. That's a one percent run. Amazon went up three point three five percent. Well, Google went up one point six two percent. Gold is at 2029. The 10-year Treasury went to 3.42, so it dropped yesterday. Gold went up a little bit. Amazon soared. I have no idea what's going on, but I know that if you have to buy a house, if you if you want to buy an investment, you got a window because the money comes into Treasuries when people are skittish. That presses down the interest rates. It shows up in the mortgage rate that you can get, and you only get the best rate 
if you've got a bank working on behalf of you. Sierra Pacific Mortgage is the lender. They're the underwriter. They do it soup to nuts. And if you call andrewandtodd.com at 888 you got to move. Or maybe you're a senior citizen and inflation has wrecked your budget and you have to get a reverse mortgage. Please do it with my longtime friend, Andrew Del Rey, and my, my newer friend. I've only known Andrew. Uh, I've known Andrew Del Rey for 20 years, Todd Abakian for half that time. Go to andrewandtodd.com or call them at 888-888-1172. I'm coming right back. Highlights from last night's town hall and more text when I return.
Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. If you don't know, the universe is where you go to get every, you have to subscribe, but you get every minute of the radio show without anything except the embedded ads, no news, traffic, weather. So it takes a three-hour radio show, and it makes it about an hour and a half. It also has within it the ability to text me. If you sign up for the text, I text you, you respond to me. This morning I just texted, what do you think? What's your opinion of Donald Trump? Something like this. I'm sorry, Hugh, writes Chuck in the 612. I didn't watch. Decided to rely on your analysis. I watched two episodes of The Diplomat instead. I have no idea how big the audience was last night. Uh, the overnights are not in yet. But here are the most important uh, back and forth last night. Here is President Trump on inflation cut number 25. Drill, baby, drill. We were energy independent. We were soon going to be energy dominant. And nobody had ever done what I did. We got oil down to $1.87. Actually, it fell lower than that in some cases. We had to save the oil companies that the price was getting. So we were doing incredibly. We had the greatest economy in the history of our country, probably the greatest economy in the history of the world. We were energy independent, soon to be energy dominant. We were going to be bigger than Russia and Saudi Arabia put together times two. We have more liquid gold under our feet than any other nation, any other nation. And these stupid fools ended it. And energy went from a dollar eighty seven and even lower for gasoline for a car. They went from a dollar eighty seven to five, six, seven, eight, and even nine dollars. And your electricity bills went through the roof, your heating bills went through the roof. And that's what started inflation, and it hasn't stopped because people are paying now for bacon and for eggs and for the two and three times what it was just a little while ago. We created the greatest economy in history. A big part of that economy was I get, got you the biggest tax cuts in the history of our country, bigger than the Reagan cuts, bigger than any... Cut. And, and also, Caitlin, also, as you know, we got the biggest regulation and regulatory cuts we this place was rocking and then we were given a gift from china and china paid a big price and let me tell you something i took in hundreds of billions of dollars in taxes from china but prior to COVID coming in and then i rebuilt the economy again a second time but we had prior to COVID coming in as as from china from wuhan which i said it came from wuhan everybody said oh you're wrong about that you're wrong it came from wuhan i said it right from day one so we had the greatest economy in the world. Here's the story. Uh, they made energy so high, and energy is all invasive. It is massive as an industry and as a cost. It lifted everything. If Mr. you President, made, don if you made donuts, if you made, no matter what you did, and but we had inflation the likes of which, I guess we haven't had, they said, for 52 years, but I think more than that. We had no inflation. We had the lowest energy prices we've had in decades. This country was rocking and rolling. And by the way, we had the most secure border in the history of our country. Rendell Cut number 26, the former president on the Russia invasion of Ukraine. 26. Yeah. Uh, our, our, tri our TriCaster is being uh, funky. No cut 26? Okay. Um, I would sit down. Let, let me just put it a nicer way. Uh, if I'm president, I will have that war settled in one day, 24 hours. How would you settle that war in one day? Because I'll meet with Putin, I'll meet with Zelensky. They both have weaknesses and they both have strengths. And within 24 hours, that war will be settled. It'll be over. It'll be absolutely over. Do you over. want Ukraine to win this war? Uh, I don't think in terms of winning and losing. I think in terms of getting it settled so we stop killing all these people and breaking down <laughs> this country. That answer is a um, adroit non-answer. I think it's actually fairly adroit. Chris Christie did not think that. He said he had to conclude that Donald Trump is Putin's puppet. I don't know. But let's go to uh, a question from the audience. Will you move past 2020 election cut 24 from Donald Trump last night? Will you suspend polarizing talk of election fraud during your run for president? Yeah, unless I see election fraud. If I see election fraud, I think I have an obligation to say it. And you know what we went through uh, a short while ago has really put our country in a big problem. Uh, I hope to do that. I hope we're going to have very honest elections. 
Uh, we should have voter ID. We should have one-day elections. We should have paper ballots instead of these mail-in votes. But uh, the answer is yes, and I hope that it's going to be very straight up, because if it's going to be straight up, we're going to win the election. Another of my texters, Dave from the 713, no change for me. Trump is Trump. And while I voted for him twice, I'm done. Not this year. I'll skip president on the ballot if he's nominated by our party. Uh, so, look, I don't think it moved anything last night. I think it's going to be the debates. And if uh, the president doesn't go, I think he'll lose ground. If he does go and dominates, he'll gain ground. But it's going to be that. ReliefFactor.com. I'm in the ReliefFactor.com studio. I'm holding it up. I took it an hour one. I took it an hour two. I'm not taking it again. Twice twice a show when the knee is barking at me like it's been for two weeks. But it's getting better. That's because Relief Factor and not doing stupid things. Like, don't go seven miles on your first day back in Virginia. And so just dialed it back to five yesterday and just felt great. You know, it, it is what relieffactor.com exists for, which is to ease the minor aches and pains. It's not going to heal a broken arm. It's not going to repair my C5, C6. That is, you know, that's not what Relief Factor does. What it does do, you get tendonitis. It helps your body calm the tendonitis. That's what relieffactor.com Tennis elbow, runner's elbow, trundlers, everything, relieffactor.com. Senator Cotton is next. I want to talk to him about Ukraine, about China, and about the debt limit, and much more. Stay tuned.
Welcome back, America. It's Hugh Hewitt. Brett Baer and Chris Christie and Tom Emmer and I all agree the most important thing said last night by Donald Trump in the town hall was that, hey, if we default, it's psychological. Senator Tom Cotton is, of course, in the middle of this because he's one of the closest uh, to Leader McConnell and one of the influential senators. Senator, what did you think? Good morning. Welcome. Great to have you. Good morning, Hugh. It's good to be back on with you. What did you think of last night's town hall generally? And then let's get to the debt specifically. Um, Hugh, I'll, I'll confess that I watched the Sox beat the Braves last night to once again win their road series uh, to go back home to Fenway in the playoffs ahead of your Guardians. Um, <laughs> I've seen some of the coverage this morning. On the default question in particular, there's no reason to default. Um, Speaker McCarthy and Senator McConnell both said we shouldn't default, uh, but it's really on Joe Biden's shoulders. Uh, House Republicans passed a good bill that would raise our debt uh, ceiling in a responsible fashion by reducing spending up to $5 trillion for 10 years. And Joe Biden has continued to pretend like that didn't happen and that he has no responsibility to either support that legislation or propose an alternative. Um, Now, I know that they've begun negotiations this week. I hope those proceed in an orderly fashion and that Joe Biden accepts the reality that the American people sent a Republican majority uh, to the House of Representatives in part to stop the runaway spending in Washington. Yeah, when uh, one thing President Trump said last night is when he was president, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer were running a debt limit run. They negotiated. That's also what Barack Obama did with John Boehner, and they negotiated. I don't think the president knows what's going on, Senator. Do you? Do you think he knows the <laughs> details of this? I don't, Hugh, maybe he doesn't even know that the House passed that bill two weeks ago. <laughs> I, I do believe that this no negotiations posture is driven in part by senior White House aides' uh, unwillingness to have Joe Biden sit down with Kevin McCarthy and actually try to hammer out in an hours-long conversation a detailed, complicated resolution. I think that's probably beyond his abilities at this point. Um, but it's true what you say, that it's not, not just Donald Trump, but every modern president, maybe every president of my lifetime, Hugh, has at various points had to increase the debt ceiling, oftentimes uh, with the Congress controlled by the other party, and we've been able to do it every time. And there's been a lot, there's been a lot of emotion and drama and threats to walk away from the table. But in the end, presidents and congresses of the opposing party have raised the, raised the debt ceiling, and they've been able to reach an agreement that did so, um, you know, on better or worse terms, depending on how you do it, without a default. Joe Biden now the, is the one who's taken the cynical and irresponsible position that he wouldn't even sit down at a table, wouldn't even negotiate with the people's elected representatives. Now, I get upset because the uh, White House says we're cutting veteran, we being Republicans, are cutting veteran benefits by 22 percent. You are a veteran. Do you think we're doing that, the House bill? Does that do that? I haven't read it. I don't know, but it sure doesn't seem no, like something no. we do. No, Hugh, of course it doesn't do that. That is nothing but a lie coming from Joe Biden and the Democrats. Kevin McCarthy called him on it in the Oval Office earlier this week. Uh, they're, they're spreading those lies uh, about House Republicans' bill because they don't have their own proposal beyond simply capitulate and raise the debt ceiling irresponsibly at a time when we're still running record high deficits. Um, but it says nothing at all about cutting veterans' benefits. All right. Now I want to switch over to the Judiciary Committee. I'm writing a column for the Post about Leader McConnell, and uh, he's got a lot of nicknames like Cocaine Mitch and Midnight Mitch and the Grim Reaper. They ought to call him Mitch. Didn't I already tell you the answer, McConnell? Because he told the Democrat he's not going to help them pass judicial nominations. <laughs> and Diane Feinstein said it's not even a problem. What You're on that committee. What is the situation? Well, Hugh, just to tie a bow on the uh, on the debt ceiling matter, uh, since Senator McConnell said it earlier this week, that we don't have a secret plan in the Senate to bail out Joe Biden, uh, I'd go a step further. We don't have a secret plan to have a secret plan to <laughs> bail out Joe Biden. <laughs> like, no one is sitting around thinking that if we get to this day, okay, Mitch McConnell and Republican senators are going to swoop in and undercut House Republicans and save Joe Biden. It's not going to happen. Senator McConnell... And I and Republican senators have said since January, the American people sent a Republican majority of the House to put the brakes on Joe Biden's runaway spending. The sooner Joe Biden gets on with it and sits down with the Republican House members, the sooner we can raise our debt ceiling in a responsible fashion. Now, to your point about Senator McConnell and judges, um, when Senator Feinstein uh, came down with the case of shingles, she was not able to attend anymore. 
Democrats began to claim, oh, this is paralyzing the Judiciary Committee. We can't confirm any of our judges. You know, we need to do her the courtesy of you know, temporarily removing her from the committee. Never been done before, as far as I know. The only reason it would be necessary, Hugh, the only reason it would be necessary to replace her temporarily or permanently is to, so the Democrats can confirm judges on a party line basis. We have confirmed, or I'm sorry, we have voted out of committee numerous judges over the last three months in Senator Feinstein's absence on a bipartisan basis. The only thing her absence has prevented Democrats from doing is confirming radical, unqualified judges on a party line basis. And Senator McConnell's simple point was, why would we encourage the Democrats to do that? I, it's, it's just unbelievable to me that it's reported as other than the leader always says what he thinks. He said this is going to be between McCarthy and, and Biden. I got nothing. I'll go down to the Oval. I'll sit in the office, but I got nothing to do with this. And he's right. And we're not going to help Democrats confirm radicals. Are these the judges who are being held up, the ones that didn't know what Article 2 was or what the uh, Brady motion is? Are these those two? That's a, f- a few of them. I think that- I think you, uh, unless a couple have slipped by without my nose, I, I think we're only talking about four or maybe five judges whose nominations have so far not passed down to the Judiciary Committee. And I would point out it's be- not only because they don't have Senator Feinstein in attendance, it's also because they may not have the votes from the full Senate, uh, and they may be waiting to keep those nominees in the committee until they can nail down that they've got an actual 50 votes for these radical judges. And in some cases, I, I think they probably don't. Okay, I want to switch to Christopher Ray and the FBI and the Comer report yesterday. Uh, this stinks to high heavens. I mean, it just does. And first, your reaction to the 10 bank accounts and the 10 LLCs and the bank accounts and the $10 million. What would you think? Well, Hugh, I want to commend uh, James Comer and Jim Jordan and uh, the Republican House members who've been digging into the corrupt Biden family dealings. I mean, look, Joe Biden's family doesn't have a business. It's not like they got into politics after a successful career as car dealers or plastics manufacturers or real estate developers, their entire family business is trading on Joe Biden's uh, influence in office, and it has been for 50 years. And if they did it when he was merely a senator or the vice president, is there any reason to think that they're not doing it when he holds the highest office in the land? I mean, when Joe Biden, or I'm sorry, when Hunter Biden is getting millions of dollars from Ukrainians and Chinese and Romanians and Kazakhs. I mean, do we really think that Joe Biden is some kind of latter-day Metternich, that he knows so much about all these countries that he's going to uh, yeah. get millions of dollars from them? Obviously, Hunter Biden is and his family is trading on Joe Biden's name. He's paralyzed by the lack of Ben Rhodes, who is the Metternich of MSNBC. He can't do a thing. But Senator Cotton, I want to go back to these LLCs. They distribute money. What I think a special counsel is warned for is those people who got the money needed to invoice. They needed to declare. I don't know that anything happened. We've got so much more evidence for special counsel than we had for the appointment of um, Robert Mueller. Do you agree with that assessment? Well, there's certainly a lot more evidence of wrongdoing by Joe Biden and Hunter Biden and Jim Biden and his whole family than there ever was about Donald Trump. Um, you know, there is a, a counsel, I think it's the appointed U.S. attorney, Delaware, who stayed off in the Trump era, is investigating Hunter Biden. There are reports that an indictment might be imminent. I, I suspect that there is an indictment, though, Hugh, that it's going to be on ticky-tack process files. It's not going to get to the heart of the matter, which is how the Biden family trades on Joe Biden's name and influence. Well, this is, you know, it is in Delaware. There was a meeting for Hunter Biden at the Department of Justice, which usually means a target letter. Christie agreed with that. Former prosecutors have told me that. But I'm not sure that we've got Ray and the, the FBI financial crimes team on this. Have you seen any indication in the Judiciary Committee that they actually are concerned? Because, I mean, $10 million to the president's family from Romania, China, and Ukraine is a red flag. Well, no, Democrats on the Judiciary Committee, no, you know. I mean, they're like a phalanx of bodyguards around Joe Biden. Um, and, I mean, any time— you raise with them, the Biden family, and especially Hunter Biden, they basically just avert their eyes in embarrassment. I, I just don't know how we get out of this box. Senator, let me wrap up by asking you about the president, uh, former President Trump last night on Ukraine. Here is what he said, cut number 26. Oh, that, that doggone tape machine just is not going to work for us today. Cut number 26. There we go. If you were I would sit down. Let, let me just put it a nicer way. Uh, 
If I'm president, I will have that war settled in one day, 24 hours. How would you settle that war in one day? Because I'll meet with Putin, I'll meet with Zelensky. They both have weaknesses and they both have strengths. And within 24 hours, that war will be settled. It'll be over. It'll be absolutely over. Do you over. want Ukraine to win this war? Uh, I don't think in terms of winning and losing. I think in terms of getting it settled so we stop killing all these people and breaking down this country. Senator Cotton, there was not, I don't believe, I might have missed it, one question on China last night. There was this exchange on Ukraine. What did you think of it? Um, well, Hugh, I suspect at some point the president also made what is it, an even more fundamental point is that if he had been in office, as was the case for the four years he was in office, his war never would have started. Um, because Vladimir Putin would have been successfully deterred from doing what he's always wanted to do going back 23 years, which is invading Ukraine to help reassemble the greater Russian empire. Um, I suspect if President Trump is back in office, that Vladimir Putin will have more incentive to end the war if it's not ended by then. In the meantime, the best way to do that, the best way to force him to a negotiating table, is to give Ukraine the support and the tools it needs to take back its own territory and make Vladimir Putin realize he has more to lose on the battlefield than he does at the negotiating table. What is the General Secretary Xi and Vladimir Putin and Khamenei take away from President Biden's, I mean, it's not hapless, it's alarming performance of the last week and then President, former President Trump's town hall. How, what do they think of American foreign policy right now? Um, unfortunately, I, I think they, they think that they've got about a 18 or 20 month window right now to go for broke. I think it's a, a very dangerous time in the world as Iran and Russia and China have gotten more and more aggressive as they realize that Joe Biden is not up to the task of defending America's interests and helping lead a, an American order that preserves peace and stability around the world. So I worry very much that they'll, they feel that um, the next year and a half, next 20 months or so is when they should go for broke to achieve as much as they can of their objectives. Underline that, America, Senator Cotton was the first one to call out the virus and its threat in 2020. He's underscoring what I think we are in a period of great danger. It didn't come up last night. I just cannot believe it, but that's the way it went. Uh, Senator Cotton, thank you. Don't go anywhere. I'm going to talk with Patrick McHenry, chair of financial services, is next on The Hugh Hewitt Show. Portions of The Hugh Hewitt Show brought to you by Sierra Pacific Mortgage. For more info, call 
Welcome back, America. My guest to wrap up today's show is Chairman of the House Financial Services Committee, Representative Patrick McHenry. Representative McHenry, welcome back. How are you? Great to be with you, Hugh. My first question is pretty direct. Um, the FDIC insures deposits up to $250,000, but evidently there are some banks that have a better guarantee. What is the rule? Whose money is actually insured for more than $250,000? Uncertain. Unclear. Uh, what the administration attempted to do in that first weekend of after Silicon Valley Bank failed was to reassure depositors that your deposits are safe. Yes, it's very clear that under the insured deposit level, all deposits are safe. We've not lost a penny of that in the last 90 years. Over the deposit level, well, it looks like we have uh, three different standards, two big-to-fail banks, top five banks. Um, those that were affected in uh, the bank failures, the three banks uh, that have failed, the three of the 30 largest banks in America that failed. Uh, and then another class of banks where we're not sure. Uh, I think uh, a lack of clarity here is a real blow against uh, financial stability and it's really a uh, not smart policy for this administration. How do we, that is exactly, I have no idea if my money's safe. I have no idea because if if it's a bank is going down, I know it's safe to two hundred and fifty thousand, but I have no idea which banks are going to go down, and I don't know when the FDIC and the Fed will step in. Do you like? I'm, are there secret conversations underway that people know and don't know? <laughs> uh, very few secrets in this. I mean, what they were attempting to do is is tell everybody be stable, be fine, and and let this thing go. No one is talking about the root cause of this. And the root cause of these three bank failures is inflation, the inflation that started out of federal spending by this administration uh, and the poor economic management of this administration. So we're, we're dealing with the symptoms. We're not dealing with the disease. And, this, and the disease here is quite nefarious for everyone who spends a dollar in America. Well, it's also a disease of ambiguity. I, I honestly, Chairman... I don't know what the rules are. If, so, if I'm a lawyer to a bank right now, I don't know what to tell them. What do you think bank lawyers are telling their clients? Oh, it's a complete mess. And I, I want people to have clear rules and uh, clear, a clear uh, uh, mode of operating. That, that's, that's been our gift as a country. We have legal clarity, and so people know that they're going to be treated fairly under the law. Uh, that, is, that is what we uh, assume as a country. Uh, and right now, that lack of, of clarity is really um, is, is really harmful. When Silicon Valley Bank went down, Mr. Chairman, uh, Roku, and I just use them as the example because the one that sticks out, had a half billion dollars on deposit. Half billion dollars in one bank. And they didn't suffer any penalty for that. That is at least, you know, two strikes and you're out for the chief financial officer and the and the controller of, of Roku. But what do you think of that? If we're not going to enforce it, I can't blame them. Well, look, this goes back. The, the, the challenge here is there's an assumption going back to the financial crisis that the big banks get bailed out and everybody else is left holding the bag. We have to make it clear that we're going to allow for failure in our economic system. And allowing for failure uh, means that you can actually have capitalism, you can have freedom. Uh, but without without that failure uh, and the consequences of that failure, meaning your you know, your stock holdings go to zero, um, you know executives uh, feel the consequences of the, of the the failure that they presided over or enabled, uh, then we're going to have uh, more bad economic um, decision making. Uh, let me go to what the former president said last night that a default on the debt would be more psychological than anything else. Do you agree with that? Oh, it's going to be psychological, all right, but it's also huh? going to have severe consequences. <laughs> yeah, when people look up the and the senses. markets have dropped twenty five percent, that's going to be a psychological knock. Well, look, when the rest of the world's trying to uh, de-dollarize, uh, get their transactions out of U.S. currency, um, uh, you know, because of Russian sanctions and our sanctions regime, in part, and uh, in a number of different reasons, uh, we don't want to give them further reason. Uh, to take their holdings out of dollars. We get huge economic benefit by the world transacting. Lost another congressman. They really do not know how to stay on the line. That's Tom Emmers and Patrick McHenry. And I know what they're doing. They're walking outside of Congress. He's back. Um, 
Chairman McHenry, you're back. Uh, continue on with that, please. Welcome oh, back. the beauty of the cell coverage here in, in yes. Washington, D.C. Uh, uh, no, it, with the rest, of the, the rest of the world trying to uh, use different currencies other than the U.S. dollar uh, to do international trade, we should not enhance their ability to do that by defaulting on the full faith and credit of the United States. It's, it's not smart economic management. Um, and we shouldn't be playing games with it. We should address our fiscal house, pair spending down, assess our long-term uh, spending challenges as a country, and make that clear to the American people, and at the same time put growth policies in place so that we can, uh, we can live in a, a more prosperous America for everyone. Last, last question, Chairman. we got 30 seconds. Is the Biden administration negotiating seriously right now? No. Wow. I, I, ju- I just can't believe some days what goes on in this country when we're on the cliff and dancing. Patrick McHenry is not one of those people who believes in brinksmanship. He's great to have his chair of financial services in this period of time. Keep coming back, Mr. Chairman. Don't go anywhere, America. The uh, grand old pod today is, I believe, Generalissimo and Lilacs. So go over to the universe. Send me your text uh, responses. Sign up for my newsletter at HughHewitt.com. The Chris Christie interview transcript and audio is posted. Audio of other interviews will be available. Thank you for listening today. I'll be back tomorrow on the Friday edition of The Hugh Hewitt Show.